President, please be seated. Now it is time of the submission by the OCP, so you can proceed now, co-prosecutor. Good morning, Mr. President, Your Honours, everyone in and around the courtroom. Today we reach a further important stage in the adjudication of criminal responsibility of Nguyen Chia and Kyu Sampong for crimes committed during the democratic Cambodia regime four decades ago. This appeal hearings deal with those charges which the trial chamber decided to severe and heard in the first part of case 02, what is now known as case 002-1, charges of crimes against humanity committed during the forced transfer of the population of Phnom Penh in April 1975, a further forced transfer between zones that started later that year and a massacre of former soldiers and officials of the Lunon government also in April 1975. Litigation in this case started with the co-prosecution's introductory submission filed with the co-investigating judges in July 2007, eight and one year, one half years ago. Since that time, this institution has ensured that a team of experienced and capable national and international lawyers have represented the accused throughout the proceedings before four separate judicial chambers, the co-investigating judges, the pre-trial chamber, the trial chamber, and now, Your Honor, the Supreme Court chamber. Hundreds of witnesses were interviewed during the investigation and tens of thousands of pages of documents placed on the case file. Many dozens of legal motions have been litigated before these four chambers, resulting in important developments in international criminal jurisprudence that will have significance long after this institution has closed its doors. Et dont l'importance se fera sentir longtemps après la fermeture de cette institution. The trial on the charges in case 002/1 began with the opening statements in November 2011 and ended on 31st October 2013. During the two years of trial, the court heard from 92 witnesses, civil parties and experts. The lawyers representing the appellants were given the opportunity to question each of these witnesses. This figure of 92 witnesses does not include the two appellants who each gave limited testimony before indicating they wished to exercise the right to remain silent and not to answer any more questions. Nevertheless, on the final day of the trial's oral arguments, both appellants took advantage of the opportunity given them 
by the trial des chamber to have the final word Donc, ici, and each gave a speech instance, without being obliged to answer any questions. All parties, including the appellants, were given the opportunity to present documentary evidence and to challenge those the doc to challenge documents sought to be admitted by the by other parties. The trial chamber, after having examined all of the evidence found both appellants guilty of multiple charges of crimes against humanity and sentenced them to life imprisonment, both appellants have appealed their convictions in case 002-01 and claim the trial was unfair. Last November, when the appeal hearings were scheduled to begin, Your Honours allowed Nunchia to make a further public statement where he called the proceedings a, quote, mockery of justice, unquote, and said that he had instructed his counsel to boycott the appeal hearings. Nunchia claimed, and I quote, You refuse to give me even the chance to tell the Cambodian people my side of the story. Your Honor, Nunjia has had every chance to tell the Cambodian people his side of the story. His side of the story, however, has repeatedly been found unconvincing. In case 002-1, Nunjia started to testify, but then decided he did not want to answer any further questions from the prosecution or the judges. Nunjia chose to remain silent, which, in, which is his right respected by this court. But it is disingenuous for him to assert his right to remain silent, then tell the public that he was denied the right to tell his side of the story. Last November, Your Honours gave Nunji another opportunity to state his grievances with this appeal, and even listened patiently even while he attacked your own judicial integrity. What his statement made clear is that he does not want to engage in a real debate about the strength of the evidence and the fairness of proceedings. Because the more the public learns about those proceedings and the evidence produced, the more obvious it is that his complaints are meritless. In the trial of this case, a great deal of time, money, effort, and patience has been expanded to ensure that the findings are based on facts, based on evidence, and that the process was a fundamentally fair. In criminal cases dealing with massive atrocities, it is simply impossible to call every possible witness to testify. Millions of people witnessed the crimes of evacuation of Phnom Penh and other crimes of the Khmer Rouge, and obviously all of them cannot testify. The Tadic trial chamber recalled that courts have long recognized that an accused is entitled to a fair trial, not a perfect trial. In order to complete a trial within a reasonable period, 
any court dealing with such complex cases must make difficult choices. It must select only the most relevant witnesses and must ensure that the parties confine their questions to issues relevant to the case. However, the strategy of the appellants in this case has been to do everything possible to shift the focus of this trial away from the crimes of the Khmer Rouge by any means possible. Of course, they do not want the court or the public to pay attention to the evidence of the policy they promoted that led to the deaths of millions of Cambodians. The evidence of guilt of the appearance is simply overwhelming. This is why Nguyen Chia has long said he knows he will be convicted. Like other accused in history, who know the evidence of their guilt is too obvious, obvious to contest. Nguyen's tactics from the beginning have been to try to discredit the court and turn the trial into political theater. His lawyers even stated in their response to the co-prosecutor's opening statement that they intended to act as court jesters during the trial. Despite these provocations from Nguyen Chia's lawyers, the trial remained focused on ensuring a fair trial. When the trial chamber limited defense questions or arguments to those relevant to the charges, they were simply doing the job required of any competent court anywhere le travail in the world. Dans le monde. Your Honours, I believe that the ECCC court serves two very important purposes. First, it, demon it demonstrates that those responsible for the gravest crimes cannot escape accountability no matter how senior their rank or how much time has passed. Secondly, it teaches Cambodians and the rest of the world that a just society is based on the rule of law and all persons are entitled to a fair process, both victims and the accused. Listening to Nguyen Chia's speech in November, where he lectured your honors on fair trial rights, I was struck by how obviously this court has succeeded. Now, even Nguyen Chia acknowledges the importance of a fair trial, although his own regime destroyed all courts and operated under no law, instead executing those they suspected of disloyalty, relying on confessions extracted by torture rather than real evidence, and providing no trial or legal representation at all. There is a video in evidence in this case, where Nguyen Chia tells his biographer that he had no regrets about the killing of those he suspected of disloyalty as he considered those smashed to have been enemies of the people. Unquote. So, one of the successes of this institution and this trial is that we have shown the world and even convinced Nunji that justice requires law and a fair process.
et par une procédure équitable. L'homme a assimilatement l'argument de la demande ou d'accorder du crédit à ses arguments, malgré leur manque de pertinence. The record shows that both the trial chamber and this chamber have carefully considered all of his requests and arguments. Indeed, this chamber even took the extraordinary step of calling three additional witnesses on appeal solely on the request of Nguyen Chia. Sur la seule demande Yet, when de those Nunchi, witnesses appear before this chamber, or, their evidence not only chambre, did not provide any exoner exoneration for Nunchi, they further confirmed his guilt. Mais ont plutôt, uh, sa In their appeals, both Appellants complain that the court relied on statements and writing of persons who did not testify at trial, and they claim that such evidence is unreliable. But it is a fundamental principle in civil law systems, such as those of Cambodia and France, that judges can admit such evidence. Further, in the jurisprudence of all of the international criminal tribunals, such as, such as out-of-court statements and hearsay writings are admissible as long as the judges consider the nature of the evidence in deciding what weight to give to it. The appellants themselves asked the, the court to admit statements of witnesses who did not testify. In his speech in November, Nunchia claimed the most serious violation of his fair trial right was the failure, failure of the trial chamber to summons Heng Samran to testify. In uh, his appeal brief, Nunji asserted that no living person appel, was more Nunchi directly uh, and personally responsible for the evacuation of Phnom Penh than Heng Samrin. But in his own statement during uh, trial, Nunji contradicted procès, Nunchi this Nunchi when he admitted that he and other parties Cent, uh, party center leaders, not division and regiment commanders like Heng Samrin, planned and ordered the expulsion of the population from Cambodian cities. Heng Samrin was not even present at the early April 1975 meeting at which the plan to attack and evacuate Phnom Penh was conveyed by the center to division commanders. Two witnesses testified in K002-1, Mien Nguyen and Ung Rain, who both held the same rank as Heng Samran in 1975, and who both participated in the forced transfer of the population of Phnom Penh. In his appeal, Nguyen Chie claims it was critical to ask Heng Samran what were the orders that commanders received about what to do with those who refused to leave the city. Yet, when Mie Huyen and Ong Rain testified, Nunchi's lawyers never asked them questions about orders on how to empty the city. Nunchi put great emphasis on notes of an interview Ben Kenan conducted with Heng Samran about a meeting where Nunchi spoke. Uh, this meeting took place between 20 and 25 May 1975, a month after the massacre at Po Chere and the forced evacuation on Phnom Penh. 
So it could have little effect Cette on réunion n'avait donc convictions. guère d'incidence sur la condamnation prononcée contre lui. In any event, en tout état de cause, notes of les notes interview de l'interview de Hain Sambran ont été versées en preuve et uh, sont partie examinées par la Chambre de première instance. In those notes, Hain Sambran said that Nucci had instructed the cadre present at the meeting to conjunct the people of the old government. Those familiar with the Khmer language knows that Komchat means to get rid of or eliminate. The former Lunol officers and officers who still survived by May 1975 were already removed from their positions and scattered around the country by the forced transfer policy. There can be no doubt in the context at that time that Nunchi's order meant to kill all those who remained, which the evidence shows is exactly the policy that was implemented throughout this regime. Nunchi claims Hain Samrin was critical as his only character witness. He does not explain why he chose a man whom Nunchi accuses of betraying the Khmer Rouge and with whom he was at war for 20 years. The only character trait Nunchi has ever claimed Hain Samran would testify to was Nunchi's de dedication to the Cambodian Revolution. How Nunchi's dedication to the ultra radical and ruthless revolution that the Khmer Rouge imposed on the Cambodian people could possibly cast doubt on Nunchi's convictions in this case, he fails to explain. Nunchi's final ground of appeal is most revealing of the kind of evidence he relies upon and the weakness of his case. He claims the trial chamber denied him a fair trial by failing to consider evidence obtained by torture at places like S21. He asked that your honors rule that accused persons, even those who are responsible for torture, should be allowed to use this evidence for their own benefit. Despite the ban on the use of such evidence in the internationally recognized Convention against Torture, contre la torture internationalement reconnue. This apparently is a key part of Nunchi's side of the story. Evidence obtained by starving, beating humiliating and electrocuting victims until they would say whatever their interrogators wanted them to say. Your Honours, throughout the pre-trial, trial and appeal stages in this case, both accused have been provided with a team of experienced and competent counsel who have aggressively followed their instructions about how to defend their case. They have each been given extensive opportunities to examine all of the witnesses who testified to propose and challenge documentary evidence and to put forward all relevant arguments in both oral and written form. The defense failed not because the trial chamber was unfair, but rather because the evidence showed that these crimes were committed and that both Nunchi and Kier Sampon played key roles, making them criminally responsible for the suffering that resulted. Their trial was fair and their convictions justified by the evidence. Se justifie au regard des éléments de preuve. Thank you. 
I will now hand the floor to my colleague to further address the grounds. Rest. Pour répondre aux autres moyens d'appel Thank you. Merci. Good morning, Your Honours. Bonjour, Mesdames et Messieurs les juges. Bonjour, Messieurs, Mesdames et Messieurs les avocats. Your Honours, Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, vous le savez, l'appel à Nguyen-Chia n'a pas eu de réponse à notre dossier. Donc, je vais diriger mes remarques vers le dossier et les commentaires faits par l'avocate de que son banc aujourd'hui. En ce qui concerne les arguments faits par Nguyen-Chia en ce qui concerne l'équité du procès, nous avons dit que les arguments faits dans notre dossier de 300 pages ont été déposés en avril dernier montre de façon substantielle qu'il y a eu des arguments donc, pour un procès équitable. En fait, les juges, juge, l'accusation estime que ce procès a été tout à fait équitable. C'est véritablement le contraire de ce que l'avocat de Kusampan a dit aujourd'hui. L'avocat de Kusampan a dit qu'ils avaient dû sacrifier certains faits dans leur dossier en ce qui concerne le droit à un procès équitable. Mais lorsque l'on regarde ce dossier, ce qu'ils ont sacrifié, c'est qu'ils ont sacrifié la démonstration selon laquelle ce procès aurait été inéquitable. Aujourd'hui, lors de notre audience de ce jour, les avocats de la Défense ont également sacrifié la démonstration de cet argument. Il n'y avait pas eu suffisamment de temps. On a utilisé des métaphores, des analogies avec le procès de Tokyo et en disant que c'est la même chose ici, mais sans rien montrer, sans argument. En se référant également à la façon dont deux témoins avaient été interrogés par la cour, par l'accusation, les juges, la défense, et donc ceci ne montre pas que le tribunal est impartial. Des questions qui font partie de milliers de questions sur une période de 18 mois et sur un processus de trois ans. Les incidents ne démontrent pas que la Chambre agit de façon impartiale. Et donc, le juge, dans cet incident, n'était pas... Une référence était faite à un juge qui n'a pas interrompu les questions faites à Pipon. Donc, Pipon était l'un des témoins les plus crédibles qui est déposé devant cette cour. C'est un membre de haut niveau du Parti communiste du Cambodgea, ministre des Affaires étrangères, et qui a été donc qui avait admis les politiques criminelles du régime. Et le fait que le juge Lavergne ait posé la question à la femme de Kyosampan, c'est tout à fait son rôle dans un procès de droit civil. Il faut que le juge soit convaincu sur la crédibilité des témoins. Il ne s'agit pas d'un procès où le juge reste en dehors du procès. Et donc, l'accusation et la défense doivent assister à la cour à cet effet. En référé à une conférence, on s'est rendu la juge Cartwright en novembre à la fin de l'audience. Donc, une fois que tous les éléments de preuve avaient été entendus, après deux années, ou plutôt 18 mois et neuf mois de procès préliminaire, et la défense vous demande de conclure 
Judge Cartwright's que knowledge that la she had and the Cartwright mind that she avait, had euh, after nous hearing connaissance the evidence, avait un certain état d'esprit après avoir écouté les preuves au cours de cette période de deux années et from hearing the trial before it began et donc avait euh, certainement une opinion Your euh, honors, in that conference Judge Cartwright expressed the, the, pouvoir, the, the difficulties of the Cambodian judiciary historically Um, the fact that uh, the judiciary has come out of um, a situation of conflict, Khmer Rouge period, donc and the following, and that's all that expression was. Donc, uh, as far as que, uh, la juge her comments dire, in relation to the trial, the trial being fair, uh, when you look at that video, Judge Cartwright said the trial was fair. And as my colleague has said, there's no perfect trial, but we would submit this was fundamentally inequitable. fair. Donc, il n'y pas d'avoir un procès parfait, mais c'est un procès équitable. En ce qui concerne les remarques de Judge Le Monde dans son livre, quelqu'un lui a dit qu'il y avait des interférences essentielles dans le système judiciaire du Cambodge. Bien, cela ne suffit pas pour dire que cette chambre de première instance avait ou agi de façon non indépendante. En fait, mesdames et messieurs les juges, dans la mémoire de la défense, que son pan offre seulement quelques exemples de décisions qui, selon eux, démontreraient que la chambre agit de façon inéquitable. Donc, il en faut plus pour déterminer une impartialité. Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, la défense a également fait référence à une erreur de la Chambre de première instance lorsque ils ont pris en compte des événements qui ont eu lieu avant la période de compétence de la Cour, c'est-à-dire en 1973. Concernant la conduite des accusés, la défense fait référence à Nahamina. Et la décision dans ce dossier, il s'agissait de voir l'intention de savoir si l'on voulait inclure commission des actes qui auraient aidé à la commission de crimes et ce pour les inclure dans les délibérations. Et ce qu'ils ont trouvé dans ce dossier, dans le cas de l'ICTR, ce statut, les drafters ont explicitement voulu exclure des actes qui ont eu lieu avant la commission de crimes. Ce que les drafters jurisdiction de la Cour a commencé pour quatre mois Before the genocide was committed, but here, Your Honours, that's clearly not the case. The Kisampan defence have not demonstrated that the drafters of this statute wanted the acts of Kisampan, the planning acts. À ce que les actes politiques et de que son plan qui se sont produits avant le 17 avril 1975 ne pouvaient pas être considérés pour déterminer leur implication dans les crimes commis après le 17 avril 1975. Si ça avait été le cas, cela aurait voulu dire que the senior and most responsible for the crimes, the planners of the crimes, the plus élevé, their acts could not be considered in determining whether they were involved in the crimes committed after the 17th of April. There's no argument that was intentionally drafted to exclude that. In the case of Nahimana, there's clear argument that the intenders of the statute il y a un argument clair pour dire que on souhaitait simplement inclure les actes donc devait être inclus ceux qui, étaient, euh, qui ont été commis quatre Your mois Honor, avant uh, la période de, de la compétence temporelle uh, du tribunal. Of, uh, uh, donc vous avez pris connaissance du uh, mémoire. La uh, défense de Kyu Sampan est la seule équipe qui uh, n'a pas fait appel à l'ordonnance de uh, After the two severance orders were made, 
they didn't appeal either of them. There was no lack of certainty in terms of what Hugh Santana was facing. Sur, uh, he was quite aware que, that he was facing the charges of uh, forced transfer, Donc, and then when the additional forcés, crimes were um, added, et des crimes supplémentaires ont été ajoutés. One year later, Un he was après, also aware il savait that également he was facing the crimes qu'il faisait face à des euh, aux crimes de Troy Potray, ainsi que les politiques connexes. Lorsque l'on parle du droit à un procès équitable, bien, bien évidemment, la protection de cette garantie est de veiller à ce que personne ne soit condamné d'un crime that they're unaware of, dont ils ne sont they pas conscients, qu'ils ne comprennent pas, pour lesquels ils ne peuvent pas se défendre. Case, Dans ce cas, Kyu Sampan a été uniquement condamné aux crimes liés aux déplacements forcés émanant de ces politiques. Il a simplement été condamné pour les crimes liés Uh, the executions at Tool ah, elle, aux exécutions de Tual Potray et qui ressortent target, donc des politiques uh, visant à cibler officials. les responsables de la République mère. Il n'a été, euh, été condamné d'aucune autre chose. Et c'est euh, là que l'on voit sure, que cette protection visant à veiller à ce qu'un procès équitable soit à savoir qu'on ne peut pas être condamné d'un crime dont on n'est pas conscient, et bien nous voyons bien là que ce droit n'a pas été violé. Il n'a pas été condamné pour quoi que ce soit, donc il n'est pas été conscient. In addition to the um, averment that uh, the uh, fair trial right was violated by the lack of uh, sufficient uh, notice of the charges, there is an argument related to fair trial issues in that the defense did not know um, or was not allowed to use evidence that uh, went out of the scope of the charges defined by the severance order, yet later the trial chamber used evidence Um, from outside, so to say, events Donc, as it um, uh, deemed uh, fit. Utilisés, in, and uh, uh, we would be interested to, to hear so, about this environment of certain imbalance in the deriving of the evidence that was related to Um, to, to events outside the, 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 of the scope of the charges si uh, and not allowing the defense to derive from um, events laying outside, uh, outside, uh, outside of the charges. But um, it, it, whether you would address it here or uh, in uh, the approach to evidence Uh, section um, Ou lors in de an event, it would be, it would be preuve, interesting for us to, to hear on que yeah. vous puissiez intervenir Thank à you, Honours. Um, I can address it now, or I understand I see the time. Can I have five Alors, je vois le temps qu'il est. que je peux bénéficier de cinq minutes supplémentaires pour répondre et donc répondre ensuite à votre, à votre question par la suite Your Honours, Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, in relation to en ce qui concerne this trial, ce procès and the fundamental fair trial rights, et le droit fondamental à un procès équitable, Q. Sampan, Q. Sampan was promptly informed of the nature of the charges. Informé rapidement de la nature des accusations. Il connaissait ces accusations. In September 2010, en septembre 2010. He knew about them. Il en a pris connaissance. When the scope, the reduced scope of the severance order came into place. L'étendue de l'ordonnance. In uh, September 2011. Est entré. And he knew about them. En 2011, in October, et il l'a également pris connaissance en, October, en October septembre, 2012, octobre 2012, lorsque l'on a ajouté les crimes supplémentaires. Les documentations, les rapports, les ordonnances de la Chambre de première instance, les transcriptions du procès montrent cela de façon cohérente, montrent qu'il était tout à fait au courant des accusations auxquelles il faisait face et qu'il euh, n'était pas accusé d'autre chose que ce qui est tombé dans le cadre de la portée de, du dossier. Son droit a été protégé. Même si euh, plusieurs parties étaient en désaccord, 
about the severance of the trial. Non, ça va être été relativement étonné de cet ordre de détention, mais le procès s'est poursuivi. Les autres moyens d'appel de Q. Sampan ont dit qu'on n'a pas protégé son droit à une défense appropriée, qu'il ne pouvait pas répondre, que reconsidérer les requêtes et que cela était incohérent et qui ne connaissait pas véritablement les règles. Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, je, je vous demande de jeter un œil à ces documents et la Chambre de première instance a été tout à fait cohérente tout au long de, euh, du procès, donc en ce qui concerne le dépôt des euh, réponses et des demandes requêtes. Ils se sont également plaints des témoins et pour autant la défense a bénéficié de la moitié du temps de la même façon que l'accusation. Ils ont pu donner deux ou trois exemples. When a judge interrupts you on one or two occasions because your questions are repetitive, donc un juge peut tout à fait vous interrompre lorsque vos questions sont répétitives ou ne sont pas pertinentes. La défense est également plainte qu'il n'a pas eu l'occasion de remettre en cause les éléments de preuve ou d'enquêter. We didn't have an opportunity to challenge. And just to conclude, Your Honour, when they talk about they didn't have enough space in their closing brief, of which they had 125 pages plus another extra 20, which is 145, plus the ability to use endnotes instead of footnotes to lengthen the brief, they say they didn't have enough space when they decided to use footnotes and not lengthen, not lengthen their submission. Your Honours, perhaps we can... Um, Perhaps one final word, and, and this is this is that Monsieur issue of sacrifice. Um, I think when you read their brief, it's absolutely true. They sacrifice to demonstrate their arguments and show how any violations of fair trial rights invalidated the judgment. They did sacrifice that. You, you can see that when you read it. And that was also done today. And when you look at their brief, their main argument is not that individually every alleged error of a violation of their fair trial right would invalidate the decision or cause a miscarriage of justice. They're saying that um, cumulatively um, that would lead to an invalidation of the judgment or miscarriage of justice. But what Q-Sampan defense haven't shown is the effect of any of these alleged errors, which, as you know, we've argued are not errors singularly. They haven't shown how those errors, if they existed, how they compound on each other to invalidate the trial. We argue the trial chamber went to great lengths to make sure this trial was fair. Because de of the de of it. Pour and any of these incidents de ce that the Q-Sampan team raised in their brief, even if one or two of those si errors occurred, de, de which we debate, none of them, cumulatively, would make this trial unfair. unfair. You look well how long it went, the ability to call witnesses question witnesses, present documents, debate documents, and have final statements. So, 
Your Honours, our position is Donc, Madame, Messieurs, that juge, notre position when you la suivante, look at the evidence, si vous when you go preuves, deep into the evidence, si 5,800 documents uh, and the process si vous prenez that toute occurred la procédure over the three-year period that the période child chamber had laquelle, um, control of that file, la um, it was absolutely and fundamentally et bien, fair. Le procès a été absolument et fondamentalement équitable. Je vous remercie. President. President. Let me now close the uh, first semantic session Bien, of the appeal uh, proceedings due to the changes and the time lapse. Let me now uh, continue a little bit further on the uh, second ground of the appeal related to the overall approach to evidence. And I would like now to give the floor to the uh, co-rapporteurs. Pour ce volet. Judge Gennarand, this Judge is the co-rapporteur's report for session Voici on grounds for appeal related to the overall approach to evidence. Several grounds of appeal brought by Noon G and Kiyosum Pon challenged the overall approach of the trial chamber to the evidence on which it based the convictions. These arguments may be grouped as follows. First, a category of arguments relates to the allegation that the trial chamber erred by limiting opportunities for investigation or that generally the investigation was not conducted properly. Here, Nunji and Kiyo Sampon aver that the investigation into case 002 carried out by the co-investigating judges was flawed by procedural irregularities and that the trial chamber did not correct these problems because it failed to carry out additional investigations and at the same time insisted that the defense is not entitled to carry out its own investigation. Second, a category of arguments Autre relates to the trial chamber's practice of allowing witnesses and civil parties appearing before it to review their prior statements and confirm their content when appearing before the trial chamber. The trial chamber limited the questioning of those witnesses and civil parties to clarification and credibility issues. The appellants argue that this approach by the trial chamber amounted to an error. Third, a category of arguments relates to the alleged violation of the accused right to confront the evidence against them. In particular, it is submitted that the trial chamber erroneously disallowed questions by defense counsel aimed at challenging the reliability of the evidence based on purported errors and misconduct during the investigation. Fourth, a category of arguments relates to the trial chamber's reliance on out-of-court statements. Nunji and Kiyo Sampon submit that the trial chamber erred in the standard it applied to admit out-of-court evidence, such as written witness statements collected in the course of the judicial investigation, civil party applications, and victim complaints. They also submit that the trial chamber failed to correctly assess the reliability and probity value of the written statements did not provide sufficient reasons for its decision 
to rely on uh, written statements and erroneously relied on written statements to establish key facts that were in dispute between the parties. Fifth, a category of arguments relates to the trial chamber's decision to rely in the judgment on testimony of the civil parties from the substantive hearing, as well as their testimony relating to the impact of the crimes on them, specifically statements of suffering and victim impact testimony. The appellants argued that the trial chamber's reliance on this testimony was wrong and disregarded the low probability value of such testimony. Six, a category of arguments concerns the trial chamber's assessment of the testimony of witnesses who appeared before it. The appellants allege several errors in the trial chamber's assessment of the probability value of both fact and expert witnesses. Finally, there are several specific arguments regarding the trial chamber's approach to evidence, including its treatment of hearsay evidence, assessment of secondary sources, and application of the beyond reasonable doubt standard. Nunchi also challenges the trial chamber's finding that torture tainted statements are inadmissible in the proceedings. This concludes our report on the grounds of appeal relevant to the second session. Thank you. President, thank you. We need to return now for a uh, uh, lunch break. And the, cha the chamber will resume this afternoon at 1.20 p.m. Security personnel, you are instructed to take the accused to the detention facility and have them returned this afternoon before 1.20 p.m. The court is now adjourned for lunch.